our host, the world-renowned Christine Enville, an IFBB professional, three times world champion, a mentor, an icon, and of course, a founding co-owner of the best supplements money can buy, International Protein. In this episode, we learn all about peak week, what muscle groups to work out and when, glycogen and sodium levels and how it relates to getting your best results, what to eat and how to dry out so you look best on stage. Peak week, what is it? What does it look like, Christine? Please explain. Okay, peak week is what bodybuilders talk about as being the week before their competition where they do a whole bunch of different things to what they've been doing for the last 12 or or 20 weeks to optimise the way that they will look on stage. So the idea is that you want to really bring out all that definition, bring out the vascularity, really, really suck that skin around the muscles um, and look essentially, you know, anywhere from 10 to 50% better than what you've looked every day in the gym leading up to it. So the idea, uh, you know, bodybuilding is a sport of illusion and, you you know, what you see on stage where obviously there's the tan and there's the oil and everyone looks like they're totally shrink-wrapped, that is um, all a result of um, obviously the diet, but you don't just look like that by stepping on stage after dieting. There's a whole bunch of things that you manipulate between your carbs, your sodium, your water, and that's, you know, that's what you do to achieve that look on stage. So normally for most people it is about seven days. Some people it might be five days, but it's essentially you start counting down from from one week before the competition. So if the competition's on Saturday, it would always be really like for me Sunday would be kind of where we would start to look at peak week. And I'm guessing that if you have to travel somewhere, you want to have your peak week in that destination. Absolutely, yeah. It, that would always, like I'd always try to try to arrive on the Saturday and then, you know, I would have a, a full clean, you know, peak week wherever I was going. Um, I did try it once coming in on a, I think a Wednesday and it was a big fail, <laughs> really didn't work. Um, some people do, if you're traveling, um, like Americans I found would kind of like travel in on a Friday night for the Saturday show. Like for some reason they kind of like that because I guess they're still getting that, um, dehydration effect off of the airplane and that, but it's a little bit risky when you're coming in from overseas to try to do something like that. And then of course with the professional shows, there's usually a whole bunch of meetings and things that you need to do on the day before the competition. So you absolutely needed to be in you know, well before that. But if you're traveling internationally, you definitely want to be in town and you want to go through that whole week, basically, um, you know, in, in the local area. So what is what does peak week look like? So from a training point of view, uh, my favorite thing is always to do my last leg session as the you know as far away from the competition as possible. So that would normally be the Sunday before a Saturday competition because, you know, once you've done a, a heavy leg training session, there's a lot of swelling, um, you know, you, you lose a lot of your cuts. There's also, you know, of some DOMs and stuff like that. So you you want to have done that so that by the time the next Saturday hits and you're in competition mode, all of that settled down and all you've got is freaky cuts. Like that's that's what you want for your legs. So you then structure the rest of your training system. I would do it so that the Wednesday would be my last training workout and the Wednesday would essentially be a little bit of everything other than legs. So even if I had have done chest on the Tuesday on that next Wednesday, I'd still do a little bit of chest, but you just basically do a a whole body workout just to pump some blood. You weren't trying to do any crazy weights. Um, It was really just about to, um, you know, I guess burn out that last little bit of glycogen and, and, um, but obviously, you know, the the Monday and Tuesday would just be a regular session for, um, you know, try to hit your whole body really like legs on Sunday. And then between, um, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, we're trying to hit everything and then repeat the muscle groups that had been hit on the Monday and the Tuesday. So essentially that would be the training point of view. At that point in time, um, you're not trying to break any strength records. You're really, really mindful of injury. Um, so you're really just, again, it's just trying to get blood in the muscle. You know, again, you've la- if you've landed in a new country, you just want to just really get your body moving and make sure everything's primed. I talked about burning out some glycogen. Uh, that's because obviously this another part of peak week is that you're, um, you're trying to basically deplete your body of carbohydrates so that you can hypercompensate and take in more carbohydrate and store more glycogen in your muscle than what you would have if you just had have gone through a normal week because the idea is that the more glycogen in the muscle, 
the bigger your muscle looks when you get onto competition. So you can look, you know, 20, 30% larger once you're all carved up and, and filled up. Um, and it also, that stretches out the skin, so it gives you a more ripped appearance. So it's all, like I said, it's all that, that illusion. And and how you do that is, um, you know, generally what people would do is, you know, as early as Monday, but definitely by Tuesday and Wednesday, dropping out your carbohydrates and really like, you know, so that's why you're training on no carbs, you're burning out those, the glycogen, putting your body in a state where it really wants to hypercompensate now. It must be really tough. It's not fun. <laughs> a lot of broccoli, a lot of fish or chicken. Um, you know, you're, you're hungry, you're weak, you're trying to um, you're trying to get the reps out, you feel like, you know, flat as anything, um, And but that's what you want. You know, that's when you know it's working. If you're not flattening out, you know, you're not going to get it. You're not going to get a good carb rebound. You're not going to get that good hypercompensation. So it's it's mentally it's tough because you will go from looking you know pretty good the week before, then all of a sudden you get flat and you lose a lot of your cuts, and you have to trust the process. Like you have to know that this is this is temporary, and then I'm going to move to this phase here, and then it's going to all change again. So, so trusting the process is. Uh, do you think people don't trust the process and do it wrong, and they bail out right at the last minute on some uh, occasions? It, it is the hardest week. 100 percent people do that because um, one, if you're if if you have a coach that knows what they're doing and they're telling you certain things, and you do trust them and follow them, then you know you're you're in a good place. But I. I have the, I guess, the privy to kind of seeing, um, you know, I guess behind the scenes of a coach and, and what their clients go through and that week is tough because they'll trust the process up till that point and then they do, they get they get so scared um, because it is so anti, what's the word, anti-intuitive and they, they if they haven't been through it before, it can totally freak people out because people mm-hmm. think you should just be going on this smooth curve and just looking better and better and better and better and not understanding the, you know what you're what you're actually trying to do. So I've probably seen more people mess it up during peak week through you know not being patient, um, not trusting it, and even um, you know they have a weigh in the day a lot of the times the day before a competition. And I've seen people who try to peak for the weigh in so that they look impressive and then they look absolutely terrible on the actual competition day because they've like basically peaked a day too soon. So mm. it's all mm. in the timing. And, on, and conversely, I've seen people who look amazing the day after because they were too scared to eat and looked flat and terrible on stage because they didn't, they 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 forget that the reason is looking great on stage. The reason is not about starving yourself. And a lot of people kind of like, oh, well, I can't eat now because I've, you know, I've spent all this time dieting and it doesn't feel right to go and eat this food, not understanding the, what the purpose of that is. Um, it's not about, you're not doing this just for the purpose of not eating food or, or being mentally tough on a diet, the purpose is to look amazing on stage. Mm. So it's remembering what that's all about. But it's it is probably the the thing that I have seen done most badly by more people because it is it is um it is very scientific and it but it is also at the same time you have to be again mentally very disciplined to not do something too soon, to not freak out, to um to push past a lot of things which seem not right to you um, and also and get through that training session. So it's it's tough from a whole bunch of different re- different perspectives. So it almost reminds me of fighters um, cutting weight just before you know just for the weigh in, dehydrating themselves in a massive way and then replenishing just before the fight as well. Similar similar it, sort of process similar, to put your body through. Yeah, it's a similar sort of process. I guess a, di- a different end result. Yeah. Um, in that theirs is all performance based now. There's all appearance based, um, but it is most definitely that that same kind of thing where everything that you did in the let's let's say you've dieted for 12 weeks in the 11 weeks prior to getting to peak week is all is all for that purpose of getting your body fat low and then everything that you do in peak week is for the whole purpose of, of as i'm going to keep saying it looking amazing on stage because mm-hmm. it's about mm-hmm. looking you know that that 20 percent better 30 percent better than what you possibly could have looked if you just had a dieted and stepped on stage so that's that is the whole purpose otherwise you would you would just diet and step on stage and that would mm-hmm. be guaranteed that you would look a certain way but with bodybuilding, we're always striving to look better. So you want to try to pull that something out of the Twenty bag. to thirty percent is a big jump. I would. I have seen people look even close to a hundred percent. That's impressive. And, and I'm going to give I'm going to give Brandon Ray, our sponsored athlete, a bit of a plug here because he's an incredible coach. And I have seen some of his clients, you know, th- d- during their peak week, or even you know how they've come to him 
and seeing them through the process and the difference to the definition and just how they look on stage, I am just like, my goodness. Like I, I don't, you know, I would say in a lot of my shows I would have got, you know, sometimes 50% better um, but but it was kind of hit and miss and sometimes I might look 50% better and sometimes I might look 50% worse if you mess it up. Yep. And then I found a system where I was pretty much 20%, 30% better consistently. I could do it consistently. Um, but, um, yeah, Brandon has a, a, a very specific method and it's not a one-size-fits-all. It is a very hands-on method where he's constantly monitoring his client and making the adjustments based on how they look. And But the, but the results are absolutely phenomenal and, it, and it, it really is. You're just like, how did you get that person? person from that to that you know and that's his you know his genius mm-hmm. um and that's why i say if you have a good coach who um who is there stepping through you you know every step of the way do listen to what they're saying but the unfortunate thing is there's also a lot of coaches i guess that are kind of you know t- trying to figure it out still themselves so you, you know th- that kind of thing you need to look at who people have coached and who they've put through that process and, and make your determination on whether you think they know what they're doing or whether they're just kind of guessing at it because, it, as I say, it's the most scientific part of the whole process and it is the most, um, you know, you've got the opportunity to, to make something look brilliant or make something look, you know, less than brilliant and, you know, finding that place in between which is consistent and repeatable because the one thing that I know about Peak Week is that um, it changes what you need to do depending on your body size. Like if you're a bodybuilder who's progressing up through the weight classes or, you know, putting on size every year, what you need to do when you're weighing, you know, I guess as a female, 58 kilos as opposed to when you're weighing 68 kilos is a totally different ball game. Like it, it just changes everything how your body um, responds to different things that you do, like the carving and the drying. So you've got to be very, very mindful that it isn't something that will be the same every single time that you prep. Uh, and the other thing that you have to be mindful of is that how the condition that you come into a, a, um, a, a that last peak week. And this is something that I remember. You know, I'm not sure if people know who Chris Cormier is. He was one of the you know the premier pro male bodybuilders back in the early 2000s. You know, when I was competing through, and he used to say like, you know, if he came into a show and he wasn't as lean as what he felt he should be, then he would do a very, very heavy deplete in that last week. If he came in and his conditioning was on point, he would handle it totally differently in that last week so your run into the show is very very important like how hard you've worked in those 11 weeks or whatever coming up to your competition does dictate how you handle the 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 actual peak week so it's different like I say in in every single situation but if you're doing a run of competitions like you do your first one and then you've got two weeks later one and another week later one like what I had in my amateur days it's a lot easier because not not a lot has changed and you can really refine that process you can really like look at the timing that you did things look at the impact and then make adjustments like you might decide that you what you ate before you went on stage you should have eaten half an hour earlier to get a better result or you should have um you know eaten twice as much of it or all those little so, things so in saying that do you actually record everything you do in peak week as well times Absolutely. everything like that Absolutely. along the journey Yes. Yep. Yeah. So so cuz when you're when you're getting ready for a competition in those 11 weeks you have a program set out for you for example that you're following so you kind of just have you don't have to think you just follow your program and then when you get to that peak week, if, you, if someone's giving that to you, then they will have written that down for you to follow. If they're like Brandon kind of proactively changes things, then, you know, he's telling that person, okay, now do this. Because I did my own peaks, what I would always do, I would have a plan. Um, and then if something deviated from the plan, I would write that down. And adjust it. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And by the by the final competition of that run, I would have a hundred, I would like, each time I would get it better and better yep. and, and um, you know, learn from those little tweaks and, and really, you know, you, you get, you really have to learn your body, like learn mm-hmm. to read your mm-hmm. body, how it reacts to certain things, how strongly it reacts to certain things, everything from, you know, your training session to your, your posing that you're doing, you know, leading into, into that posing that you do in those last few days it's because all of that then impacts on what you do backstage and in those last kind of final hours before you get into competition so it's very very if you you know you can kind of make it as detailed as possible do you I get guess. a do you get a bit of smack talk backstage no you don't you know, every bodybuilder supports each other as opposed to you know the old sledging in the cricket, for example. No, like <laughs> funnily enough, like it, the female bodybuilders were very, like pretty, pretty casual, pretty cruisy, a lot of camaraderie backstage. You know, no one like that's awesome. Same, same with the male bodybuilders. But um, I do remember when I was competing, um, NABBA, the NABBA figure at the universe, like they, they they didn't really want to talk to the female bodybuilders. They just wanted the mirrors. 
they just <laughs> they're like pushing everybody out of the way to get in front of the mirrors and the the um, men's physique guys are kind of like that like the bodybuilders kind of sit back and chill and then it's like the men's physique boys are all in the mirror and oh, yeah. trying to like and the, the body was just kind of like, oh, yeah, whatever <laughs> so it, it's it's more like interdivisional Rivalry. But you but you don't have a Conor McGregor there up in someone's face trying to break their soul, you know? No, because yeah. because it's because it's not because you're not fighting someone or something like that. It's like the judge's decision. Like the the decision is in the hands of the judges. Yeah. Whilst you like, I'm, I'm not saying that people don't psych people out. Surely it's a mental game. It's though. a mental, yeah. 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 And and what and what we kind of would do was. Um, we would wait till a certain particular period of time till I would take off my my st- my clothes, like to, yeah. to pump up. And I do remember a few times where people, like, you'd be the, in the area, all covered up, and you take your clothes off. And I remember one time, one of my one of the competitors, she's pretty much walked out because she knew she lost. Oh, really? At that point, yeah, yeah. And she did, but yeah, you know, it, it's that thing where until you really see that person, I guess you've kind of got that hope that maybe this year you've got them, but. When you kind of see it in reality, it's like, ah. Oh, I see that as poor sportsmanship, though. It, yeah, it was. Yeah. It was. Yeah, yeah. And 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 again, it does. It transcribes to stage because you can you can still like bring yourself up, I guess, by being more confident on stage. And that's you, if you look great and you bring yourself down by not being confident. If you're not as good, you can you can still bring pose yourself up. Mm-hmm. and pose mm-hmm. a certain way and that's why posing's such an important part of your presentation and how you present on stage and the confidence because this is this is digressing a little bit from peak week but um just in terms of stage mentality i always looked at it like i'm there to entertain i'm there to make you feel comfortable on stage so i want to project that and if i because if i was sitting in an audience and i saw someone who looked awkward on stage who didn't feel confident i felt awkward yeah. and i felt uncomfortable watching them and i imagine that and the same thing as a judge you know if i'm judging and i'm, I'm someone's looking unconfident it shows in their whole body yeah. posture and the whole thing of bodybuilding is you're being judged on your body mm-hmm. so presented in such a way and you know we always used to say like take up as much room on stage as possible because that's the point you know you're there to be big so pose big don't minimize yourself and if we had visuals i'm kind of like you know showing us to like expanding your arms and 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 when you hit a pose posing as large as you possibly can rather than being all crunched up and closed in and and, um and that so that's that's just the, you know the mentality of being on stage. But just coming back to peak week, yeah. Um, so we've talked about training. So we've talked about you know running through all of your body parts, doing your legs furthest away from the show so that they're not all blurred out and and suffering from cortisol release and everything like that. Then we've talked about um, going into the depletion phase. Now that, as I said, is um, quite individual based on how you've come into a competition, whether you need to go quite hard at it or whether you, whether you can go quite moderately. Because what I found that it, it, the bigger I got in terms of the more muscle that I carried, um, if I fully depleted, and when I say fully depleted, I eliminated all of my carbohydrates for those two and a half or three days, I physically couldn't eat enough carbohydrate to reload to get to where I needed to be on stage because I just, I actually get quite tired of eating and um, I just couldn't get the food in that I needed to, to to fill back up properly. Um, And back then the science was, you know, talking about the hyper saturation and, you know, the hyper loading of carbohydrate and and glycogen. And then sort of more recent studies came out and said, look, you can still get that same effect without having to fully deplete. Um, So I tested that out and yes, you could, you could sort of half deplete. So I'd halve my carbohydrate intake and not eliminate it completely and still get enough of a result and it was like I wasn't coming back from as low a position so I could get to where I needed to go and still still get the food in and still get the look that I wanted on stage but that was because I was in the condition before before that week yep. if I had been a little bit off it would have been a, a harder depletion so that phase normally goes through for example like it might be halfway through Monday Tuesday Wednesday and then halfway through Thursday if you're competing on Saturday would be reintroduction of carbohydrates. So the Thursday night, all of Friday, um, and then into the Saturday. So that's the kind of like the the carbohydrate cycle. But there's so many different ways that people need to kind of experiment based on themselves because some people like to hyperload, say Thursday and Friday, but then on competition day just go back to their normal diet. Reason being that you don't want to have a big bloated stomach on stage. I want to feel uncomfortable. But for myself, the it's like your metabolism speeds up when you get like very you know close to competition and you start messing around with your carbs and then on competition day if i tried to go back to my my diet levels even doesn't matter how much i carved up 
Thursday, Friday, I'd be flat again by the time I'd be going to get onto stage at right. the night show because you'd have a prejudging around midday and then a night show at around, you know, 7 o'clock in the professionals. So I couldn't I couldn't only eat what I would eat on a on normal um, diet day and get through onto stage looking right. I had to eat more food. So everyone is different and, and as I said, some people do, did use that method and then kind of like felt that just going back to their normal day gave them a better result. So it's it's something where, again, it's, it's only by doing it, trying it, experimenting, see what worked that you're going to find that kind of thing out. Did you did you get the best result? Do you think you could have gone further? Did you think you went too far? So that that's what kept me competing. I think all those years is that testing and trying and 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 you know seeing could I get could I get better because it's always about you know trying to get that little bit better. So that's from a like a basic carbohydrate point of view. You know, getting into more detail on the actual day of the competition, then you know the type of carbohydrate does become a little more important too, where people are putting sugars in because you're trying to bring out vascularity. You know, you potentially you've eliminated sodium, and and again, the sodium method is some people like to hyperload sodium, then drop sodium so that they get that over um, elimination of fluid um, to help with that. Other people like to kind of you know, cut it for a certain period of time to to make sure that they don't have sodium in their system and then reintroduce a little bit right at the end because without sodium you're flat. Mm-hmm. So, that, so it's a, again, there's so many different um, variables and I would find that for myself I was a keep the sodium moderate, moderate to low most of the time but then just in that pre-stage um, pump-up meal you introduce a little bit of sodium and that would be enough to, to you know, really bring out the hardness in the muscles. And without that you just you find you can't flex as hard as what you need to. So sodium plays a role and obviously glycogen plays a massive role um, and because of remembering that all of this time you're also dehydrated, So mm-hmm, mm-hmm. which is which is then the, the third aspect of, um, of peaking, which is getting your, um, getting your fluids low or getting the fluid out between your skin and your muscle. So just so we can... Um, it's all getting very complex. I, I know. I can yeah. tell from Ash's face that he's just thinking, oh, Christ, why did we bring this up? Well, we've got so, so many questions. It's like how much of the sodium, you know, things like that. But that's, well, you know, all dependent it, on the person, right? It, it, and, yeah. again, it, it's de- it's so dependent on your diet coming into it. My my recommendation for people would be to never eliminate completely. Mm-hmm. And, again, you kind of need to experiment with your own body because the bigger you get, the more um, you, the more you need that balance, and then also does be does dep- depend on your sodium potassium balance. Like it's never a single thing in the body. The body always has a counter action. So if your potassium is low, the sodium needs to be low. But if your potassium is higher, you can afford to have sodium higher because it's the differential between the two which creates whether it's water is going to hold in the muscle, which is where you want it whether it's going to hold between the skin and the muscle, which is where you don't want it. So that's the extracellular fluid that we talk about. And the intracellular intracellular fluid is when you're talking about having inside of the muscle. Right. So the idea is obviously the, when the potassium is higher than the sodium, it stores within the muscle. When the sodium is higher than the potassium, it stores outside of the muscle. So you want to try to have your balance so that your potassium, which is obviously coming in from your fruits and natural sources and the reason why I say that is because it's actually very, very dangerous to get super high potassium. That's where people have heart attacks. That's where people die. Like it's that's the serious side of um of dehydration and bodybuilding and diuretic use is um when they basically create a situation in their body where they give themselves an electric shock. Um, is when what they call the potassium gradient is is so out of balance with the sodium, there's too much potassium and too little sodium that it basically um the electric impulses don't fire properly and you you, you shock yourself and heart stops working or muscles totally cramp up. So that that is something just to be aware of. That, um, but that's pushing things to the extreme. Pushing them to the extreme. It's not always at the extreme level where it happens. There has been deaths at, mm-hmm. at competitions of people who um, were not at the highest level, were not necessarily in the, the best condition, and they've kind of just tried too hard. And that's why I kind of wanted to, um, I guess, talk about that the drying side of it and why I said, you know, naturally you want to try to change that ratio because there's plenty of potassium in things like bananas and kiwi mm-hmm. fruit and trying to stick around things where you you can't go ridiculously outside of the range. And this is, I don't know if anyone's really noticed, but you, do, you don't see potassium supplements on no, the, on the shelves. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's, because it is dangerous. So the potassium supplements are, um, 
you know, doc, doctor prescribed and the ones, the slow K is um, delivered in such a way that it's delivering the potassium slowly into your body because obviously it's a water-soluble mineral so it will won't store in your body, it will it will flush out. So if people are looking into doing this kind of thing with competition, I, I do suggest that they talk to a doctor. So I would always go to a doctor and, and explain what I was doing and take his advice. Like I wouldn't go, oh, doctor said that, I'm going to do like three times what he said. Yeah. No, don't do that. Mm-hmm. It's not worth the risk. So you do, if you choose to go down that path of using um, things that need prescription, you do need to talk to people who know about this stuff, not your mate at the gym mm-hmm. who says, oh, I know you know, I know what to do. Like mm-hmm. when you when you're messing around with that stuff, I just I guess I want to impress how serious that actually is. Like it's potassium mm-hmm. sounds fairly innocuous because you find it in bananas, but if you get it in the wrong dosage and you get it in a concentrated dosage from a supplement, it, it can cause a lot of trouble, particularly when you are dropping um your sodium out. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so be aware of that. So think, so that's where um, in introducing carbohydrates, I would always introduce things like, um, you know, bananas and kiwi fruit were kind of my two favourite things because they had a naturally high level of potassium. Interestingly enough, coffee um, has a high level of potassium as well. That's just something of interest there. If people are still drinking coffee, that they have, that they are aware that that also contains the potassium. When you're coming into that that drying phase, reducing your sodium. Again, it comes back to feeling because you'll get to a point where if your sodium is too low, again, you will feel very, very flat and you'll feel thirsty, believe it or not. Like salt normally makes you thirsty, but when you're super low in sodium, you also feel very, very thirsty. But the water kind of like you were talking, you know, your water goes in and comes straight back out again. So that's when someone kind of knows that they're, you know, they've maybe gone a little bit too low. So it's actually a good idea to try to, whilst you're, you know, you have your diet, you're eliminating like you don't eat processed meat, obviously, because it has sodium in it. You don't, you know, you're eliminating products which have a lot of hidden added sodium, but you maybe look at inc- like introducing back some type of seasoning which has a salt base in it and um, and then actually introducing that into a particular meal to try to make sure that you still have a certain level of sodium coming into your body. So it's kind of... Um, Again, reading that, and you'll feel it from your contraction. Like if you if you're in the gym and you're not contract, you can't feel your contraction very hard, or you're flexing and doing your posing practice, and you feel like the muscles is not contracting very hard. Is generally an indication that your sodium is too low because it's it is that say it is that balance. So now I've freaked everyone out about drying. <laughs> Again, best way to, is to try to do it naturally. Like. Yeah. Um, if you're a smaller frame person, you can you normally do use a, a time method where you can by just eliminating your water or not eliminating completely. Please don't do that. Like reducing your water intake. So if you're normally taking two liters a day, that might come back to 250 mil for that day. So you're physically just not putting the water back into your body, and you can normally trick your body for about a couple of days before it says, "Uh, uh-uh, uh, I need this water." And then literally everything that you do, you just hold water. So. Mm-hmm. When you're a smaller frame person, you can do that. When you're a bigger frame person, you cannot do that because your muscle being 80% water literally is what starts to, doesn't matter what your balances are, it, it just it just gives out that water. So you end up kind of like deflate, basically, you know, peeing your muscle out if you try to dry like that. So you do have to do a very, very short time frame. You um, just gave a really interesting visual. <laughs> <laughs> For everybody <laughs> listening. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> A little, a little diagram. We do. That. We do. Or an animation. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the person just mm-hmm. shrinks down. But, yeah, the, the best method I always found as I got bigger was to literally like from so the two days before the competition like flush and when I say flush, like literally drink a lot of water. So I probably try to double the amount of water that I was used to drinking because then you'll find your um, – you're over, you know, you're flushing everything out and your body continues to dump water. Like it's like, oh, too much water. So it just – gets rid of it all and it's like kind of like the opposite of hypercompensating with the glycogen and retaining it, it ends up doesn't, it just keeps pushing that water out. So if you stop your water at midnight the night before your competition, the body is still like, oh, too much water, pushing it out, pushing it out, pushing it out. You wake up in the morning and you've like literally flushed out all the water and then you're like, okay, I'm now I'm dry, now I just have to hold that for the day. So that is probably the the safest way of doing it. Some of the natural things which can help obviously are, um, and I'm going to go get it wrong, your dandelion. There are some natural herbal um, type preparations where you're using herbs to eliminate coffee, obviously caffeine eliminates water and vitamin C are some of the natural things that you can use to help keep the water off and, and flush that out. 
Um, so that's the, you know, that is the, as I said, it's kind of like the, the safest way of, of doing that drying method. If you do choose to use diuretics, as I said, they are prescription. So you do need to talk to your doctor and, um, talk to what they say about it in terms of the dosage and the timing and the half-lives because they aren't all created equal. They do react differently in how they actually eliminate the, the water from your body and that does become very very critical in terms of what you are taking in in terms of not only your your um, electrolytes but also your sugars and, as I said, the time frame in which they work, so the timing of when you would take them. So none of this, you know, oh, you hear stories that people took like diuretics for a week for the whole week of peak week and stuff like that. And that just, that scares me when I hear people talking about stuff like that, because I could say it, it is a very, very um, serious topic and a, a dangerous thing. So, you know, most of the time a diuretic is like within 24 hours of the competition and it's only for that specific thing. And then you don't have the temptation of continuing to take it so that you look good for your photo shoot the next day. Mm. You know, you want to be, you want to be off stage and then again, rehydrating, Getting your Gatorade in, or getting your you're getting make sure you make sure you're getting your electrolytes back in. Make sure you're getting your fluids back in, and and rebalancing your body and just kind of washing that through and, and then getting ready for you know your next competition. So, yeah, it's it's a very very technical thing, but it's that the, you know the best way to do it really is like I say, find that find that very safe and reliable method where you're really pushing your body to the to the least extreme um, just because, they're, they're, you know, there's so many problems that can occur. But it's something then that you can do reproducibly. And um, if it means that you're 20% better than, than what you could have looked but not 50% better than what you could have looked, then be happy with that 20% because, you, you know, you're going to be – you're going to be safe. You're not going to be cramping up or, mm-hmm. you know, worse in a hospital or, or whatever. So, but, but that's essentially, you know, I say it, it's, it's part of bodybuilding, which, you know, the drying is part of it um, because, it, and the reason is that it's, it shows off the definition so much more. Um, obviously there's the tanning and the oiling, and that's again, part of the process of peak week. It, it doesn't obviously involve anything that you really need to do other than turn up to the tanning booth and, and get your tan put on. But getting that part of it right and getting the right darkness is really, really critical. And because <laughs> yeah. if you get it wrong, you look ridiculous. Yes. If, yep. And if the lighting's not right and, 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 and this is actually, you know, a, a topic where here in Australia, where it is mostly, um, I guess, you know, white skin people competing everyone's fairly even, but I know like, and again, you know, Brandon, he suffers from this because of his tonality of his skin is very dark. You think that'd be like a bonus, but it actually isn't because he ends up washing out all of his cuts because he's too dark. He needs to be kind of like a more of a reddy brown than a brown. And, and it, it, it really does make a difference and getting that, getting the right mixture of the tanning colors. Cause there's like, you know, red based and yellow based and getting all of that is, um, is obviously critical to, to enhancing how you look and, you know, um, if you get it wrong and you're too pale and everyone else is dark and they can't see your cuts or if you're too dark and can't see your cuts and it's also wasted because you put in so much effort and you really want to have that part, you know, 100% right. Otherwise, you know, you're not showing yourself off to to your true, I, I guess, to, to truly how you look on stage. So, you know, people laugh, I guess, at bodybuilders and kind of like, oh, why do they go so dark? Because they don't understand that once you step under those stage lights, everything everything changes. So mm. if you look normal out under natural sunlight, you're probably not dark enough um, for a competition. But at the same time with all the different divisions, they actually have a different um, tanning kind of level that they go to for the different divisions as well because they're looking for different things. So there's so much to it, Ash. You just- it's very, very complex and also fascinating for someone that hasn't sort of gone into a peak week or, or even trained professionally at all <laughs> in anything. It, but it is fascinating. Yeah, and I, I think, like, for me the most interesting part about it is that it is so like nothing that you do in the gym is really related to what happens on stage mm. like you don't pull out a bench press you're not got a squat rack out there it, it's the posing and that's you know we probably haven't touched on that so much but um you know that's something where people should be practicing that from as far out i used to say practice it from as far out as what you look reasonable because mm. <laughs> it's actually very hard to like if you're full off season and you try to hit a pose it's actually very hard to hit those poses because you can't get your body into exactly the same position. Because so where do you, for you, where is reasonable? I would say like... Could, on a timeline. On, a, on the timeline, if I was going on one of my 20 or 26-week preps, it would be at the 12-week mark. So obviously if someone's starting at 12 weeks, probably around about the 8-week mark, I would expect that they were in reasonable enough shape that they should be able to 
you know, be get into the positions that they need to get into for the poses, kind of see where their weaknesses and their f- and, and their strengths are because obviously when you're posing, you're kind of trying to emphasise your strengths and, and, you know, de-emphasise your weaknesses and you need to be at a point where um, your body's looking kind of like what it will look like on stage and then at the four-week mark get quite serious about putting that work in. Um, and then that, and sorry, that's actually the one thing I haven't talked about in peak week is cardio. Same deal with the training. With the cardio, I would normally Thursday morning would be my last cardio session, assuming that I was doing double cardio session. So I would always kind of have that last session to pull through, start to pull the carbohydrates in. And sometimes I'd go for a very, very light session on the Friday, like a very, very light walk Again, just to kind of just for me, um, because of so being so active to then come back to no activity is very difficult. Um, so I try to do some kind of gentle walk again, just to kind of keep the blood moving and feel like I was keeping the digestion moving and keeping everything kind of flowing in. But definitely on um, from then on in, it's really a lot of flexing like really utilising that time to um, to practice your posing. And, again, like the flexing also uses glycogen, believe it or not, so it helps to draw that carbohydrate in as you're carving up and keeps that, keeps that coming in. So that becomes to me a, a very important part. And even as you're pumping up, um, you know, getting ready to get on stage, the, the, that's, a, again, a huge part of, um, of where – you know, that comes in, like you don't need to do a workout really backstage and go crazy and pump up it. Just the flexing should be enough to bring everything out. And that's when you know you're actually got the right amount of carbs in you is that you only need to do a little bit of activity and you feel everything start to pump and you still feel the veins start to come out. And that tells you that you've kind of, you've got the right amount of carbohydrate because it's kind of sitting there ready to pop as soon as you get on stage. If it, if you're having to do a lot of work to get that, it means you have undercarbed. That's, a, that's just a tip on, you know, how do you know when you're ready? How do you know when you've had enough? And you have to keep yourself at that level. And often it can mean every two hours is having like a, you know, a few a few mouthfuls of rice or something to kind of keep you at that level because you don't want to drop too far away from that because it gets too hard to, to bring yourself back into that into that particular position. So um, there is, there's so much more that I could talk about in terms of, um, you know, what do you do with your protein over that period of time? Obviously, in those last few days where you're carving, you don't need the same amount of protein that you were taking in when you were training. Well, how so, about how about we leave because there's so much more that you yeah, can talk let's leave about. it to part two or we well Get and Brandon on. not just or but also and uh, people can actually ask on our Aussie Muscle Guru Facebook page some questions specifically about Peak Week and yep. Christine will answer them directly. Yep, that would be good. And as I said. Um, we can also have a chat with Brandon about that and just kind of see some of his methods because he's um, he's, he's the guru. He's yeah, he's refined it over a period of time, and I and I would say that um, he he gets consistent results with multiple clients from all different categories and body types and and everything. So um, you know, it's a something that I think is it is one of the hardest things to get right in bodybuilding. So yeah, very good. Thank you very much, Christine. No problem, Ash. Words of wisdom. If you like what you've heard, recognize that these tips, they're free. So show your support by becoming a loyal international protein customer by jumping online, hunt our product down and hit that buy now button. So once again, like, share and subscribe to our podcast so we can continue to bring you these episodes from our one and only Aussie muscle guru, three times world champion, Christine Enville.